Good afternoon and welcome. Good morning to those of you on the West Coast. I'm honored to be here with all of you and with my colleague, Assistant Secretary, Dr. Delphin Rittman of the Department of Health and Human Services. I'm Susan Rice, President Biden's Domestic Policy Advisor. One of our foremost priorities as an administration is improving access to mental health services and supports for all Americans, especially for Black Americans, so that every one of us has the resources and the tools we need to seek help when we need it. In the United States of America, a person's race should never determine their mental health. But we're here today because tragically, too many Black Americans don't receive the mental health care that they need. Rates of depression, anxiety, and mental health conditions more broadly are just as high in our community as they are for the larger population. But access to treatment is significantly lower. And painfully, Black children are now nearly twice as likely as white children to die by suicide. This administration is determined to do all we can to tackle racial disparities in mental health care. That means listening to and learning from individuals with lived experiences to ensure that our policies and programs are responsive to the needs of our people. To that end, during this Black History Month and today in this discussion, I'm grateful for the opportunity to talk directly with three Black women who speak openly and courageously about their own mental health challenges. Rather than being overcome by their experiences, these women have, have been moved to advocate for improving mental health for all of us. Their stories are an inspiration and also a reminder of how much more work we have to do. I'm honored to introduce them, as well as my colleague from the administration, who will share some of our work uh, on this issue. Joining us here today are Dr. Miriam Delphin Rittman, a clinical psychologist, Assistant Secretary for Mental Health and Substance Use at the Department of Health and Human Services, and Administrator of the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration, or SAMHSA. Also with us is Taraji P. Henson, Glo Golden Globe Award-winning actress and singer, a native of Washington, D.C., and an HBCU graduate of DC's very own Howard University and founder of the Boris Lawrence Henson Foundation, dedicated to eradicating stigma around mental health issues in the black community. And Sloan Stevens, professional tennis player and 2017 US Open champion, who's become an eloquent spokeswoman for investing in our own self-care. And Neka Agumikwe, professional basketball player for the Los Angeles Sparks, fellow Stanford Cardinal, uh, who as president of the WNBA Pr Players Association is harnessing her platform to advocate for better mental health and for social justice. I wanna thank you all for being here and for sharing your stories. Mental health is health, and it's imperative that our policies and programs reflect this basic fact. To that end, to kick off our discussion, I'd like to ask Dr. Delphin Rittman to share her own story and some of our administration's efforts to address mental health disparities in communities of color. Thank you so much, Ambassador Rice, and good afternoon or good morning, everyone. I am honored to be here today to celebrate National Black History Month with you all. Today's focus on mental health is crucial to our community and I applaud our stellar panelists for coming together on this important topic. I also bring greetings from Secretary Becerra, who is unable to be here today. Since 1976, we've spent this month celebrating the achievements and contributions of African Americans and recognizing their significant role in shaping our country. But we know the past few years have been particularly difficult for African American communities due to COVID-19, the overdose epidemic, and the ongoing wave of civil unrest. And I would be remiss in not acknowledging the recent spate of high profile and heartbreaking losses in the African-American community due to suicide as well. At HHS, we are tackling these disparities and keeping equity at the core of everything we do, which includes improving behavioral health outcomes for African-Americans and other communities. 
This past year, the Biden-Harris administration has invested over $7 billion in our country's mental health and substance use systems in the form of block grants to states and territories to provide more comprehensive mental health and addiction services. We've seen huge investments in community mental health services via the Certified Community Behavioral Health Clinics Expansion Program, which has allowed us to establish hundreds of new clinics across the country. We've made critical investments in suicide prevention and crisis care services that will help to transition the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline from the 1-800-273-TALK number to an easier to remember three-digit number 988. Our aim is to strengthen and expand the existing Lifeline network and to provide the public with easier to access life-saving services. While these investments are exciting, it's critical that we may remain vigilant in our efforts to ensure that these resources are supporting culturally responsive, high quality and accessible services. When I say culturally responsive, I think of the community developed intervention like play, preventing long-term anger and aggression in youth, which teaches coping skills to African-American boys through athletics and culture. And when I say high quality, I think of the African-American Behavioral Health Center of Excellence at Morehouse, which increases workforce development opportunities, focus on social determinants of health, implicit bias, and other factors that imp impede high quality care for African-Americans. And when I say accessible, I think of the Minority Fellowship Program, which aims to increase the diversity and better prepare the behavioral health workforce to effectively treat people of different cultural backgrounds. And I'm a, I'm a minority fellow myself, and so I feel very strongly about that program. Uh, and so I look forward to today's panel, and I thank our panelists for being here today, for sharing their stories. Discussions like this are crucial for chipping away a stigma as it relates to mental health and seeking mental health services. And so I'll now turn things back over to Ambassador Rice. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Delphin Rittman, for sharing some of your own journey and for shepherding the administration's efforts to build system capacity and, con and connect more Americans to care. Now I'm really excited to introduce Taraji P. Henson, a beloved and award-winning actress and singer who's made her mark across both television and film, from hit movies like Hidden Figures, uh, to the inimitable Cookie on Empire, to the forthcoming adaptation of uh, The Color Purple. I'll just say here, I, I've been accused of bringing a little cookie to the White House, so I'm really <laughs> <laughs> excited to, to have this opportunity. But perhaps even more inspiring uh, than Taraji's work on set is her leadership of the Boris Lawrence Henson Foundation, which is a pioneering black mental health advocacy organization named for her late father and dedicated to fighting the stigmatization of mental health in the black community as well as to providing access to localized and culturally competent therapy resources. Taraji, thank you for all you're doing and for dedicating your platform and your voice to amplifying issues of mental health in the black community. We're thrilled you could join us here today. Thank you so much for having me. Um, I mean, I just wanna say that I think sometimes when people see um, elite athletes and celebrities like myself, you know, we're, we're kind of revered as like role models and heroes, you know, ma making us seem superhuman. <laughs> While the spotlight, you know, may seem glamorous, it adds pressure, you know, to be perfect and elite. And it masks our trauma and our own mental health challenges. So, um, you know, to keep my sanity, I felt like you know, when God gives you the mic or he puts you on a certain platform, it is your responsibility to do something to help the people. And, you know, throughout my own suffering, I started the Boris Lawrence Henson Foundation. And first, when we started, we just wanted to um, have conversations, open conversations about, you know, mental health uh, to eradicate the stigma, especially in the Black community, because we just don't talk about it. Um, and so this year, our theme is joy over everything. You know, Black people, we have a way of turning our pain and trauma into joy. So that's what we want to focus on. Um, we're giving, you know, you want to give yourself space and you want to acknowledge your past pain from your trauma, both individually and collectively. You know, and then we're going to move into our wholeness and personal joy with the resources that, you know, we provide. 
you know, our program and initiatives, we, we, are, we are partnering with urban school districts and HBCUs to offer free mental health services. Um, we also provide an after school, this is my favorite, an after school hangout for students, parents, and teachers to have a safe space to discuss, you know, stressors and challenges with mental health, um, with mental health professionals. We always have professionals who need that family so we have, we can learn tools. Um, you know, our mental health scholarship fund supports a pipeline for um, recruiting uh, young uh, adults who are interested in studying in the field. We have um, given away 14 $10,000 scholarships so far, so far to students. Our mental health wellness support program offers free therapy sessions. If you didn't know, we started that during the pandemic. Um, we approximately have given away 5,000 free sessions so far. 46% uh, of um, the people are new to mental health and 97% are African-American participants. So we are very excited about that. Our resource guide cultivates an online directory of culturally competent clinicians, practices and allies committed to serving the community. And we are coming back with our Can We Talk conference next year and our Joy Awards this year, celebrating therapists and, active, um, and advocates who have sacrificed so much of themselves and their own mental health through the pandemic. And uh, we just wanna say thank you because it, it really takes a village. That's awesome. That's so exciting. Uh, Taraji, can you tell us a little bit about what in your, your own experience and, and in your family brought you to these issues? Oh man, listen, um, like I said, the Boris Lawrence Henson Foundation was born out of my own necessity. You know, my father was a Vietnam vet, may he rest in peace. I lost him in 06. And um, he had his issues with mental health being a Vietnam vet, veteran. And then raising a black son on my own, you know, his father was murdered uh, when he was nine. There's trauma there. And then two years later, his pop pop passes away. There's trauma for both of us. And when it came time to address it, I didn't know where to go. I didn't know, I mean, trying to find someone culturally competent where I didn't have to sit down and first explain myself or explain my trauma. You know, that's a weird place for us as a black community. First of all, we have trust issues. <laughs> and so, um, you know, I remember calling my best friend, Tracy Jenkins, who runs my foundation and also the co-host on my show, Peace of Mind. Um, and I was talking to her and I was like, you know, it's really hard. I mean, looking for a culturally competent or black therapist, it's like looking for a unicorn with a purple horn. Like it's like, it's, you can't find it. And I was like, you know that, why? We don't talk about it at home. Therefore our children don't inspire to aspire to be or study in the field. And so we want, I wanted to do something about it. Um, and because I'm, privileged. I have the money. I can afford therapy. But what about the millions of, of us out there that can't? And so I'm a total empath. And I just felt like something needed to be done. And the first thing was to share, to be open and talk about my own experience and my own mental health struggles, making it easier for others to come to the light and talk about it. Because see, when we suffer in darkness and alone, um, you don't have to. And I wanted people to feel like, you know, I think my my fan base has a certain trust when it comes to me, like, you know, they really trust me because I keep it real. <laughs> and so I felt like that was something I needed to share to push us over the hump to let, like, let's just talk about this stuff. You know, we have been passed down trauma since slavery. You know, we have been passed down dysfunctional coping skills since we were brought here to America. You know, and um, I just felt an urgency to address it. And then when I got the statistics about our babies dying by suicide, that 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 right there, just I couldn't sleep anymore. Like this became my mission. Thank God it is your mission. We're so grateful to you. Thank you. I'd like to turn now to Sloane Stevens, uh, the youngest of us here, and I hate to admit it, uh, likely the best tennis player uh, of <laughs> all of us. Um, Sloan is the definition of a phenom. Uh, winning the US Open, a singles title at the age of 24 after a long battle with a foot injury, 
But even more impressive than her many extraordinary performances on the court is her advocacy and courage in sharing her mental health struggles off the court. Mm -hmm. Sloan, you've spoken widely about how you learned to prioritize your own mental health and how the world of professional tennis can help others prioritize, other athletes prioritize theirs. So I'm really grateful for you joining us. I'm a huge fan uh, and uh, I look forward to you sharing your story. That was what they told me not to do. They told me to unmute myself and I didn't. I'm very <laughs> sorry. <laughs> um, no, I'm so thankful to be here um, along with you guys. I mean, obviously, um, being able to speak and share my story is really important. And I think a lot of people struggle with sharing their story or they don't have the platform to share it and they don't have the support to share it. Um, and I'm super honored and thankful that I am able to have a platform to be able to speak about my struggles. And um, I understand that for a lot of people speaking about it and being vocal about what you've been through, like Taraji said, your trauma and really like diving into what's affecting you in your life um, is not ever easy. So I applaud everyone who is able to speak about it and address it and find help. Um, it's never easy to open up. And I think like she also said, trust issues. We have a lot of issues with being open because we're afraid that we might be attacked or we're afraid that people might judge us and being able to just kind of let go and explain what you're feeling, what you're going through, whether it be a tennis match or bullying or someone in your life in your family that's going through things that you're trying to manage also um, is difficult. And I think being able to have that support is really important because I'm one of those people who I now find it very easy to say whatever I feel or how I'm feeling, but I've gone to therapy since I was 13 years old and God bless my mom is a psychologist. So I've had an extreme amount of support, but a lot of people don't have that. And I'm, you know, I want people to be able to have that support and don't feel judged when they do feel something. And yeah, I think sharing that is really important to give other people the courage and strength to um, say whatever they need to say. That's great. So can, can you share a little bit about the pressures of, of being a professional tennis player and how you've navigated all those pressures? Yeah, it's been difficult. Um, it's extremely difficult being maybe one of 10 Black African-American tennis players playing on the tour. Um, there's not very many of us. Uh, we've had, obviously, playing with Venus and Serena and Naomi and Coco and all of these great, amazing players. There's just not enough of us. And we go through different struggles. We go through different you know, traumas and different things that affect us as people. And I think a lot of the times as a professional athlete, you're put in a box and like, this is what you're supposed to do. You're supposed to perform and that's it. And I think a lot of the times people forget that you're human. You could be your daughter, your, you know, a cousin, you're an aunt, whatever it is. And I think managing my struggles, even through like for my mom, like last year, she was like, you know, when, when you were having Twitter issues and getting attacked on Twitter, like it really affected me. And like, you don't realize how many people are affected by one person in your life being a professional athlete. And I think now I married an athlete. So now I'm even more like aware, like, okay, like his problems, like I'm, I'm way more attached to them. And I think being able to recognize, okay, I'm not feeling well because I know that I can identify those. But when I was younger, when I was 18, 19 years old, you know, being a professional athlete and learning my way through life, I was also juggling millions of people watching me on playing tennis every day. And it was just unbearable. Now I find it great because it's fun. And I, I understand the world that I'm living in. I understand social media and I understand, you know, people that are attacking me, not that it's normal and okay, but I'm able to manage those emotions a lot easier because I know like, okay, I'm overwhelmed. I need to take a minute for myself. I can manage myself easier, but a lot of the things that come with being a professional athlete, I'm sure Nick and I was like, it's just not, it's not fun. And I think what people see is just joy and happiness all the time. Oh, she works hard and she's at the US Open playing in front of millions of people and it's great. Like that's really not the reality. And I feel like the struggles that athletes face or entertainers, celebrities we face are often not vocalized because you're not allowed to be 
yourself. You're only allowed to be Sloan Stevens, the athlete that we see on TV and you need to be happy and you need to perform. But I've realized like, I can't perform if I'm not happy and I can't perform if I'm feeling sad about something. I can't perform if, you know, I haven't spoken to my mom. Like I, I can't perform if I'm, you know, not a hundred percent myself. And I think a lot of the times um, being judged for not being a hundred percent myself has to do with something that may be affecting me in my life, but to a lot of people that's not allowed to happen. So I've, I'm thankful that I've, I've been able to share my story and a lot of, you know, a lot of other people have been super supportive of, you know, just seeing me as myself and as a human and not Sloan Stevens, the athlete. And I think once people are able to accept that there's a you underneath the athlete or the celebrity, it's a lot easier to be human. Hmm. That's beautiful. Thank you so much. Um, last but by no means least, I'm excited to introduce Neka Ogumukwe, uh, a Los Angeles Sparks forward, six-time WNBA All-Star, uh, and the 2016 WNBA MVP, the same year she won the NBA, WNBA Finals. Um, what a record. We haven't even discussed how she led Stanford four times to the Final Four. Um, mm -hmm. But what I want to highlight today, Neka, is your brave and persistent advocacy on behalf of your fellow players for better mental health resources and at the very least for a more honest dialogue about the mental health challenges that we're all facing. Um, as president of the uh, WNBA Players Association, uh, you're doing extraordinary work uh, in fighting so many noble battles. Um, and I'm really, really grateful for you joining us today to share your story. Ambassador Rice, thank you so much for having me. It's such an honor to be sitting with you wonderful women talking about this. Um, I'd have to say, you know, for me uh, individually, and I think it's important for us to understand, you know, Sloan, Taraji, and I are all sitting here as established women in their field. And there's this stigma that we've always had it going on. I think that Taraji did an excellent, um, she, she explained wonderfully how she didn't know where to go. And one thing that I've understood um, that I personally have faced is that I didn't always have it figured out. And that is something that is so burdensome, um, not just for people in the black community, but for women in the black community. And I think that that is something that I learned so much um, in the year. The year that I actually became MVP was also the year that I became president. It was the first time that I had really um, been introduced to having a hands-on approach to affecting change in a league that I'm in, in a league that is so, that is just so powerfully collective in their platform. Um, and, and that was so wonderfully displayed in our 2020 season when we experienced both a pandemic and, um, and also, of course, so many issues socially and culturally with Black Lives Matter and Say Her Name. Um, you know, for me, it was, it was a bit frustrating because that year when we were experiencing the pandemic and um, the most protests that we had seen in, in our modern time, uh, there was a lot around mental health that was going untouched because there was so much going on. Uh, but, you know, we have people like Sloan, me and Taraji that, we not only still had to work, we had to use our platforms. Um, and in that, we were burdened with not only continuing to uplift our communities, but also serve as a representation for those that are underrepresented in a world in which everything is crumbling down. And that's something that I very, very seriously realized when we were planning our 2020 season on the heels of a historical collective bargaining agreement in which so much that we hadn't seen before in our league, we were able to get into um, something that really reflected our values towards equity and equality. We now had to play in a bubble um, in, in, in a pandemic in which we didn't know where it was going to go um, without any vaccines in sight at the time, um, while also still demanding 100% of our pay in a world in which Black women were so underrepresented in receiving 100% of their pay already, let alone in a pandemic. So 
a lot of these variables, um, a lot of the intersectionality that we experience as Black women, especially in sports and entertainment, I don't ever separate the two because we are performing, you know, and there's an aspect of us, like Sloan said, that is expected. Um, and there's parts of us, especially as Black women in communities um, that serve as role models, um, are not expected to reveal about themselves. And, and that big intersection is where we find mental health. And so I found a lot of my inspiration from working with women that have so many different experiences, but also I knew my job was to empower them to share their stories so we can make things better for ourselves and ultimately for those who follow us. And it's been such a, an amazing journey. It's led me to be able to be on a panel like this today where I got to not only share my experiences with such amazing and phenomenal women um, in mental health in the black community, but also share a little bit about myself because I found that in my mental health um, experience, you know, I don't always have to show up as the president. You know, sometimes it's okay for me to show up as NECA so people understand that it's not always a performance, it's not always a role. Um, and that vulnerability is, it's not, um, it's not something that's been necessarily welcome and maybe so because of, you know, those that came before us that needed protection against other things. But we need to understand that there's so much strength, strength in sharing our stories because it can alleviate the pains that we continue to endure uh, generation over generation. But thank you so much. Um, I, I'm so grateful to all of you for, for sharing your stories and perspectives. And now we're going to have a conversation and, and talk through some things, but I, I really want to encourage uh, us all to talk to each other, not me just asking you all questions. So if you all want to respond to what one of your colleagues have said or jump in or ask a question of, of me or anybody else, please do. Um, let's, let's be as uh, um, natural about this uh, as we possibly can. Um, but Taraji, let me come back to you uh, to begin with. Um, you have really focused in your foundation um, on this challenge of building a large and culturally competent uh, mental health workforce. And to, to some extent, everybody's touched on just how challenging it is to find the right kind of person, you know, uh, another black person or another black woman uh, or uh, somebody that you feel can relate to your experiences to be a supportive mental health care provider. And, uh, you know, we are working, as, as uh, Dr. Miriam said, in the administration to dry, try to build the cadre of, of qualified um, uh, mental health care providers, but it's so hard. And so tell us a bit more about what you've discovered from the work of your foundation um, and, and how uh, you, you think we might be able to do better to, to try to bridge this in really important gap, because while you know, Black Americans make up 13% of the population. They're only 2% of our nation's psychiatrists, for example. And I know your foundation is working to try to fix that. So I'd love to hear your perspective on building that professional cadre. Well, the first thing, well, what we've tried to do so far is what we can do. And that's pull together a resource guide of those that are already existing, right? Um, it's it's hard, you, you, you know, you might not find someone in your state, but that works now because we are pretty much all on Zoom now. So you can practice with someone that's not close to you because you don't have to go into the office, which I think has propelled people to want to stay on this uh, uh, mental health journey and, and continue because they feel safe within the comforts of their own home, right? It doesn't feel so sterile like you're walking into an office. So I think we, we, the pandemic has been a blessing in that light. Um, we're trying to develop young minds giving by giving out scholarships, creating a pipeline of um, students that are going to study, um, it's particularly in the black community. That's why we're giving out so many scholarships. And I just think the more we talk about it, the more our children are gonna want to study the field. Like, see, this is the first time in, in, in this world's history that we have been talking as openly about mental health. Wouldn't you agree? We have not been really talking about it. It's been kind of hush and taboo. 
across the board. And finally, we're here. And now that we're here, oh boy, we got a lot to do. <laughs> we have a lot of pieces to pick. A lot of these uh, uh, layers of this onion we're peeling back and it's just like, ooh, we have, it's, we're bleeding out almost. But what I'm loving is that so many people are stepping up to the plate because it definitely takes a village. You know, um, people are starting other nonprofit organizations. Like just one organization can't take it on. <laughs> You know, uh, we need all, everyone, it's a village. And I'm certainly proud, I mean, it's one of the most proudest things of my career that I'm doing, um, taking on this mental health piece for the black community. I'm very grateful and happy that I'm in a position to help in any way I can. Yeah, well, you certainly are. Um, doctor, you wanna jump in on the, the, the challenge of building the cadre of mental health professionals. This is your, this is your life's work. Yes, yes, yes. Thank you, Ambassador. And, and you know, Taraji, I just so have to applaud um, your work and thank you for the work that you're doing. You know, you mentioned that you're focused on, you know, building a pipeline mm -hmm. um, and, and working with folks and, and trying to get young people into and thinking about behavioral health or, or mental health as a career. Um, and so I applaud you for that because we know that unfortunately right now there is a shortage of providers of color. Uh, African Americans as well as other other providers of color across the country, um, and so that's one of the things that, that we're trying to to work on as well. So you know, it sounds like you're you're working on a pipeline in terms of younger folks. Some of the programs we fund um, at SAMHSA, so MFP, the Minority Fellowship Program, and I'm a fellow of that program, uh, will fund individuals that are going into graduate school in psychology, in nursing, and uh, even psychiatry fellows we fund. Um, and we know it's so important for uh, individuals of color to come into their helping professions um, so that we have a diverse, culturally responsive workforce. Um, I, in my own experience, I found that participating in the Minority Fellowship Program, it allowed me to, uh, for one thing, it supported my graduate school, um, but then it also allowed me to participate in leadership uh, opportunities where I was able to mentor other students. Um, and that mentoring and, and sort of thinking about the next generation of leaders is so critical. And so I, I, I thank you for the work that you're doing there. And, and certainly there's, there's alignment there. I would love to, to talk with you more about that work. So thank you. Absolutely. And I just want to mention one thing. When, when we say culturally competent, that doesn't mean you have to be Black, you know. So we right. also are in the schools as well, teaching cultural competency courses to therapists, clinicians who are not you know, um, African American. Yes. So you don't have to be black to to be to be compassionate. You know, to understand. Mm -hmm. You just have to be eyes open. You see what's going on. Yes. <laughs> yes. You know, my yes. son actually, his therapist is a white woman, and she says all the time, "I can't even imagine being a young black man and what you have to go through." See, there's compassion there, right? So now mm -hmm. he feels safe to talk about the things that are bothering him. You know. Yes. We have to feel safe, <laughs> period. Yeah, yeah. And, and thank you for that. It's really right about that. It's about safety. It's about feeling yes. safe. And, and so ultimately, you know, we want anybody to be able to work with, you know, across cultural lines. Mm -hmm. uh, and so some of our work is geared towards that as well uh, in terms of providing opportunities for people to increase their cultural uh, competence skills um, across the diversity spectrum. Um, and so, because it really is about the safety as, as you mentioned. So thank you for adding that as well. Sloan, um, you've talked a lot about uh, the need beyond getting professional mental health care to also learn how to prioritize and safeguard your own mental health um, and to take care of yourself. Um, so I'd really be interested if you could tell us a little bit about your self-care routines and how what you do for yourself has been informed or not by the care you've received from professionals. Yeah, I, it's been a journey of figuring out what works for me. And obviously as a professional athlete on the road all the time, I spend like 35 weeks on the road away from home. And I've had a lot of things happen in my life where I've had to adapt and cope and find a way to cope on my own, like in a hotel room by myself, 3,000 miles away from home and like without a parent, without my mom and like a lot of these things. And, and I feel like having a therapist tell me it's okay that you want to drink 
three bobas a day because it makes you feel better. Like as a professional athlete, you can't do that. You're not supposed to, but if emotionally that's how you're going to cope for this week, then do it. Um, I think a lot of the times being able someone telling you, Hey, it's okay that you're feeling like this. And Hey, it's okay to eat ice cream for two weeks because it's going to make you feel better. Yes. You don't want to have an emotional crutch, but you have to allow yourself to heal and go through a process in which you feel safe and you feel comfortable and you can recover mentally. I think a lot of the times you get so overwhelmed, especially me, I would get so overwhelmed and I'd be like, what do I do now? Like the only thing I have is to call home or FaceTime home and I'm far away and I don't know how to deal with whatever it is that I'm, I'm going through. Um, I think kind of like peeling back the layers of that onion again and figuring out what works for you and how to take care of yourself. What makes you feel better? Like, is it mentally? Is it physically? Do you need to go work out? Do you need to go for a run? Do you need to go to a spa? Do you need to like get a loofah and loofah your legs? Like whatever it is, like a lot of the times I feel like people don't they think if something is wrong with them, they think it's like a massive, like, oh, I need to do this in order to feel better. And I think taking that time to feel whatever you feel and acknowledge that you need something more, you maybe need something very small or you need something very big, um, acknowledging that and having someone tell you, hey, it's okay that you're feeling like this. You should find something that makes you feel better, I think is is really important because a lot of people don't, whenever you tell someone you, that you're going through something, they judge you. So instead of that, like feeling comfortable to be like, okay, I don't feel great, but let me figure out how to make myself feel better. And let me figure out how to take care of myself mentally and physically so I can show up in the world as my best self. That's great. Um, Neka, I, I'd love to turn to you and just hear about how uh, you as um, a leader of, of women who are dealing with all of the pressures and challenges of performing um, on, on such a you know, sustained basis. Um, how, do, how, do you, how do you support each other? Uh, do you support each other? Um, wh what are the kinds of things that you find as, as teammates and fellow players are, are most helpful? I mean, it's a very different experience I, playing on a team sport than an individual sport. And I wonder um, if there are aspects of, of that, that that are different than what we've just heard Sloan describe and, and how, how they bring to bear on the challenges of, of mental health. Absolutely, we do support each other. Um, and it's so, it's so interesting, Ambassador, that you bring up the differences between individual and team sport, because I think about athletes like Sloan all the time, you know, having, you're, you're, you're competing by yourself, you know, you're, most times you're competing alone. And so um, deriving some type of um, help or self-care to ameliorate anything that you're experiencing mentally can be harder because it feels as though it has to come from nothing, you know? But um, one thing that we have in our kind of built-in community as a team, it allows for um, seemingly innocuous things every day that really do contribute to mental health and self-care. Asking someone, hey, how you doing? You know, just figuring out, hey, you wanna go to dinner one day? Having these small interpersonal react, uh, uh, relationships and interactions really do contribute to the mental health aspect of a lot of things, but I'm not saying by any means that they're enough, mm -hmm. but like Sloan said, sometimes it's not big. It's something small, just simply asking and attuning to seeing how someone is doing. And I think as women in the W who continually have to advocate for themselves, it's something that we normally do. Um, I'd have to say too, you know, when it comes, when it comes to the mental health resources, I, I listened to um, Dr. Ritman and also Taraji about all the things that you're doing to, to normalize it. And that's something I know that Sloan can speak to is incredibly difficult in um, the sports and entertainment space. You know, they see you on the screen, whether you're acting, performing or, or playing sports and no one thinks about the mentality it takes for you to excel at such a high level. It's something that's taken for granted in so many different ways. And because of that, the conversation is so novel to people when we talk about having 
a great bill of health and it not including mental health. And so with that comes a disparity in resources. Right now, we um, are working harder to incorporate uh, a more standardized access of resources for players in the W. It's not something that we were able to tackle as much as we had wanted um, in our current collective bar bargaining agreement, but it's something that needs to happen. Whereas, you know, a mental health resource is readily available for every NBA team. It's not so for the W players. And you're talking about, you know, women who are competing at as high a level as other NBA players who are in a lot of cases, the arbiters of health in their family, the, um, the ones that are bringing in uh, any resources necessary for their family to live on. And a lot of our players are moms who are the primary caregivers as well. And these are all burdens that contribute to um, mental health kind of being the straw that breaks the camel's back over a period of time, especially for black women in the community. So for us as a collective, by empowering each other to listen and hear other stories, those experiences give us perspective on what others are going through in our small WNBA community, but ultimately for us to use our platforms to shed light on the fact that resources are not available or hopefully spotlight the fact that there are resources and say, you know, things that Dr. Rittman and Taraji are doing that we can make more accessible and standardize across the board so that talking about mental health is not even not just a faux pas, faux pas, but also not something that sounds so outlandish to the things that we need to live great, healthy lives in our communities. I think for, you know, it's a double whammy for Black women because we are uh, looked upon as being so strong, you know, that we've, we've driven that narrative for so long because we needed that, right? We're the bottom of the totem pole, you know, no respect, not protected. So we needed some kind of armor, but then we find ourselves in the pickle, right? We're so strong that that's why we die in these emergency rooms because that's the idea. We can take it. You know, um, Serena Williams shared her traumatic story and she's, you know, a huge, uh, everybody knows her. You would think the urgency to save her, right? But they see her as just this strong woman. And that's another thing. Here we are with this mental health piece. And we have to destigmatize that. Don't call me strong. It dehumanizes me. It makes me feel like my feelings don't matter. I don't need to pause to take time for my mental because I'm a strong Black woman. So we need to, to uh, dismantle that notion. Um, because like I said, it makes us superhuman in a way. And, um, you know, allowing yourself to be in that space is taking care of your mental. If you've got the tools, if you have the professional help you need, you won't stay in that space for long, but you have to feel it. <laughs> and for so long, Black people, we just, I'm strong, I'm going to push through, I'm going to cope, I'm a, and we can't. We, after a while, you hit a brick wall. After a while, you're going to have to deal with the trauma. You must. Something so disturbing happened to me when I was out here. Uh, I was a substitute teacher first before I broke as a, uh, you know, in the industry. And I remember I was working in Crenshaw. And this still to this day, it breaks my heart. These kids grab my hand and they go, Miss Henson, Miss Henson. It was a shootout last night. Look, look, they go to bullet holes. And I'm like, how are these babies, we expect these babies to come to school and learn with this, like bullet holes in the wall. And they talking like it's just everyday life. That never sat right with me. Being a substitute teacher, and I know I'm standing in the pipeline to prison. I think I'm, in a, I'm gonna be in a class of special ed students and in walks all black boys. <laughs> huh? Um, we don't, we call the cops on our kids when they are having a moment in school, right? We don't wonder what happened that this child is acting out like this. You know, there's always a reason and a why. Children just want to please. So if some child is acting out, our first instinct shouldn't be go to the principal's office. That baby needs a safe place to go to, to, to decompress clearly. And that's what's missing in our schools.
That is so, so true. Um, and I'm afraid we're gonna have to wrap up. I have just found this conversation to be so moving and inspiring and healing uh, for me. Um, and I hope for those who've been able to join us. Um, you know, we are all accomplished black women in our, in our respective fields. And, and the message here is we're all human. We all feel what everybody else feels, the, the good, the bad, and the, and the ugly. We all go through our pains and struggles and personally and with our families and um, none of us are immune. And uh, I hope if anything, what comes out of this is a recognition that it's okay to be vulnerable, even as we're strong. Vulnerability is strength. Yes, thank you. Vulnerability is strength. And it's, we gotta seek support and help to the greatest extent possible. Um, and I, I want to close by thanking you so much, each of you, for sharing your personal stories um, and all that you are doing um, to support mental health and mental health uh, in the Black community. Um, and I'd like to say to our audience that if you need help, uh, there, is a, there are ways to get it. And please don't hesitate to do so. For anyone who may be experiencing a mental health challenge, Please know that help is available and treatment works. 365 days a year, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. You can call 1-800-662-HELP or 4357 or visit findtreatment, one word, findtreatment.gov to learn about what options are available near you. If you're experiencing a mental health crisis, you can also reach the National Suicide Prevention, Prevention Lifeline at 1-800-273-8255. Or you can text HOME to 741-741 for free and confidential support. Thank you again, all of you, for being here today, for sharing your stories, and for those of us uh, and those of you who watch this via live stream, thank you for joining us. Appreciate you all. You make me uh, so proud. Um, and uh, it's been a huge honor to join with all of you. Have a great rest of your day. Thanks again. Take good care of yourselves.